you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and uh, we're about page 119 in your books. It's a reminder that uh, we'll finish up this lesson, uh, I'm thinking probably today, and then do the activities in the back of the book next week, and then we're going to be starting a study on the book of Exodus to support the uh, the Bible bowl, bowl theme and uh, or Bible bowl book for the upcoming year. And I would encourage you if you uh, I, I don't know who's in charge of the the Bible bowl activity for the last leaders, but I would encourage you if you would like to, and I'm sure they would uh, appreciate it. They uh, typically try to put together a whole set of questions from each chapter that the students will go, lo go over. And I'm sure they would, uh, would like for people to give them a bunch of questions that they've made up. So as we study Exodus, yeah, you might get in touch with uh, Pam or Carrie and find out who's doing Bible Bowl and, and just as you study the book of Exodus, go through and make up some questions from each chapter and it would probably benefit them as they review and try to prepare for that uh, Bible Bowl competition uh, next year. So we're trying to do that to support them, and, and I think we'll get some valuable lessons out of it as we go through it. But be reading Exodus and get prepared for us to talk about that in a few weeks. Let's start our class with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you have made it known to us, your will, that you have, through the pages of Scripture, exposed to us your plan, uh, what you have prepared for mankind, that uh, you would go so far as to give your son up and to allow him to die the death upon the cross that we could live with you eternally in heaven. We're so thankful that you care for us. We're so thankful that you want to be in a relationship with us. We pray, Father, that we'll live in such a way that we can see the, the fulfillment of our living eternally, in eternity with you. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to understand your word to live by it every day. Help us to understand the way that we need to change to be your children. We pray, Father, that when we fall short that we'll repent and you'll forgive us of those things that cause us to stumble, that you'll help us. And we know you have provided so many means for us to, to be faithful, and we pray that you'll help us to continue to do that. Help us, Father, to realize that we're on a long race, a journey that must be completed for us to receive the rewards of, of heaven. We pray, Father, you'll bless us today as we study. Help us to understand um, the teachings from the Scripture. Help us to understand what we need to do in our lives to please you. We pray, Father, that you'll bless this congregation. We pray, Father, that you'll bless those who are struggling with their health, and we pray for those who are suffering through loss of loved ones. And we pray, Father, you'll help us to be of a great comfort to one another and source of encouragement. Help us to always try to uplift and to motivate one another to do what is good and right in your sight. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us as we worship today. We pray that we're prepared and that we'll worship in a manner that's pleasing in our sight. Be with us as we go out into the world uh, each day this next week. Help us to be the examples we need to be. And as we have opportunity, let us make sure that people have uh, an opportunity to hear the truth and that they might uh, have the good and open hearts to receive uh, simply the teachings of your word and not something that we, we hold as our own beliefs. 
We pray, Father, that you'll bless us as we live our lives. And may we realize that each day there's something that we're building. Each day we're adding to what we have for uh, a building. And help us, Father, realize that we need a very strong, firm foundation in you. Go with us now and help us through the rest of this day and throughout the days ahead. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We've been talking about the question, can a Christian be lost? And we want to look at a passage to to start off with this morning that lets us understand uh, a theme that Paul's talked about already in the the book of Romans, but he talks in more detail in in chapter 8 about the carnal man versus the spiritual man. And of course, we think in terms of carnal man, we're thinking about a fleshly man, those who think after the flesh. Um, we're, we're by nature uh, uh, carnal-minded people. We, we do whatever pleases us, or we do what we want to do. And we need to understand that as a child of God, that changes. We have responsibilities if we're going to be a Christian. The idea of some that we started talking about with this lesson, can a Christian be lost, is the idea that if we're saved, we're always saved. And, and we can't do anything, you know, once we're saved, we, you know, we've, we've closed the door, nothing can happen, um, you know, we're good. We're, you, know, we're, you know, we're guaranteed. And uh, it doesn't matter what we do or what actions we take, uh, we can't undo uh, the salvation that's been given to us. Well, we touched on some passages last week, I think, that uh, answer that question, but we're going to look at some more today. So let's pick up with verse 8 of Romans chapter 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The carnal-minded man can't please God. That means when we become children of God, we've got to change from being carnally-minded to be spiritually-minded. But he says in verse 9, Ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, we have that given unto us. And uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit that dwells within us, through us understanding the Word, guides us to let us know if we're walking in in the Spirit or not. And, and we all know whether we are or not. We, when we do something and we question ourselves, well, was that appropriate? Uh, is that something that I should have done as a child of God? We know the answers. It's not like, well, I don't know. I'll have to talk to somebody else. We know whether or not we're doing what's right in God's sight. And he says here that you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you and you won't be walking in the flesh, but you'll be walking in the Spirit. And he says, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. We don't belong to God if we don't have the Spirit that is motivating us and moving us to do the things that God expects us to do in the Spirit. And he says, verse 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. We've already talked about that a few weeks ago in Romans chapter 6. But the Spirit, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. I'm doing what God wants me to do. I know what I'm doing. I'm not mistakenly wandering through life saying, well, okay, I don't know if this is good or if this is bad. I know how I'm living. And, And that's the point that we're making here. When a Christian is baptized, he starts a journey. He hasn't checked a box that says, I'm saved, and um, nothing can happen. He has fulfilled what God has said to render obedience, and salvation by God is guaranteed to await him if he lives according to what God has taught us to be righteousness. And so if we're living in the Spirit, we have a life of righteousness. But if the Spirit, verse 11, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
So since we now are in this situation of where we have been made alive or quickened because of the spirit that's living within us because we've died to sin, he says now then because that we're in that condition, look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are, we are debtors. We are debtors. What does that mean to be a debtor? It means we owe something. There's something that is required of us. And he says, because we have the Spirit living in us and no longer live according to the flesh, he said, we are debtors, not to the flesh. But he says, we're debtors to live, uh, to live after the flesh, but, but we're, we're debtors to live according to the Spirit. For if ye, verse 13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And so the point of this passage and the reason we bring it up is that once we become a child of God, we're obligated to live a certain way. Uh, it, it's not like, okay, um, I went through, you know, I, I did what everybody said, you know, I listened, I listened, I heard the gospel, I believed it, I repented of my sins, confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, I rendered uh, myself to water baptism where I come in contact uh, with the death of, of Christ and the, the resurrection to a new life and therefore I'm there and I don't have to do anything else we just started something that's all we did we started something and we started something that demands of us to live life of righteousness now, I don't mean we're not going to make mistakes but that's not what our focus is that's not where our thrust is we're still trying to live the Christian life. Now, some things may uh, hinder us. We'll stumble along the way. We've got to get around those things, over those things, somehow get them out of our way so that we continue to go down the path that we're supposed to go down. So it matters, once we're a child of God, how we live. And we can live in such a way, after the flesh, that we're dead. That, that we're, we're dead in sin. We're we're no longer alive because the spirit that's supposed to quicken us and keep us alive is not working in us. And that's something each individual has to uh, address in their lives. Am I living the kind of life where the spirit is directing me through what God has taught in scripture in such a way that I know I'm doing what I need to be doing or am I doing those things that I know I'm not supposed to be doing that, that the world where the world's tugging on me? And that's where we have to answer those questions. And if we're living according to the world, then that child of God, if he continues in that, that vein, can, can uh, absolutely be lost, according to what we're reading here in uh, Romans chapter 8. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and it talks differently about each one of them dwelling in us. Now I know we could get into a big long conversation about um, physical indwelling and I happen to have my own opinion about that. I, I personally believe it, it's true and the reason I believe that's true because God makes his dwelling with us. Our body is a temple and we could go on and, and on but Regardless of how detailed you wanted to get into that conversation, it sure leads you to believe that there is, he is dwelling in us in some form or fashion. And if he's not dwelling in us, then we are none of his. And I said all that to say this, that if he really is dwelling in us, then look who you're carrying around and involving in things that you involve yourself with or not. And, and all that that might mean. I think it's a, it's a, pretty, a pretty big concept. It, it is. It is very deep. You know, we don't quite, we don't, we don't think in the, in the depth that we, we should have. We should. Most people don't. Uh, because you, you have to, you have to think uh, beyond just what seems um, on the surface to you. You have to go deeper here. You have to think about it. Just think about it this way. Let's say, uh, and maybe y'all had a, 
um, um, a younger sibling, sib, sibling growing up. Okay, uh, imagine as it were, and I know this is this is this analogy is not most of my analogies are not good. This is not good. I understand that, but I want to get a, try to get a point across. Let's just say you're living your life and you have you basically attached at the hip a, a younger a brother or sister. Now, what do you think is going to happen to them when you go to the wrong places? Where do you think, what do you think they're going to grow up thinking? Are they going to be influenced by what you do and the decisions that you make? They're sitting there watching. It's just like they're right here with you every place you go. Now, they see you go to places you shouldn't go. What do you think they think about that? And over time, how do you think they're going to grow up? Well, could you imagine the point Steve's making is God's not like a, a sibling attached to us. He, he's dwelling within us if we're living according to the way we should. Now, we go to the wrong places or we say the wrong thing. He's right there with us. We don't think about it in terms of that. But, you, you know, he's a part of us now. If we have made the decision, if we said, let's, you know, get away from sin, I want to live a righteous life, I want to live according to God's word. Could you imagine the places that you go, even in your mind sometimes, that you take God with you? And I think we need to think about that because, uh, you know, we, we tend to separate this, and we've talked about this a number of times. We tend to separate this, and there, there's just a mentality mentality that is uh, disturbing that people believe that they they leave something at the door when they come into the church building and they come in here and they do what God wants them to do and say you know I, you know, I've satisfied God for this week or whatever then they go back and they leave and they go out the back doors and they pick up the things that they're going to do on a daily basis that are not Christ-like and that's just a reality. Now, is it right? No. And it's letting us know, why would we study this lesson? We study this lesson because we need Christians to understand they can be lost. We don't check a box and say we're saved and you know, that's it. Don't have to worry about it. I can live like I want to. God's already saved me. It doesn't matter what I do, how I live in the world. Wrong. It does matter. We're debtors. We have an obligation to live after the Spirit. And so we need to understand, and we need Christians that may be weak in the faith to understand you can be lost. We all can be lost. And, and here's the sad thing about it. We've talked about this in class too. I can live a faithful Christian life for 60 years and then just decide to just abandon it. Yeah. For instance, when I was working in the city, I had a man that uh, got work with me. And uh, he used to teach uh, Bible class. And people know that out there in the field work. And the language he'd use out in the field, I heard, now this is coming from a guy, uh, he said, this guy right here, it, using this type of language, He's supposed to be out here teaching God's word and everything. Kids, he said, I don't want him to teach my kids. And people are watching. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I just you know, it's, it's that that really lets you know that people is watching what you're doing. Absolutely. And, and, and that costs us. We have got to be careful. Right. You know. And are we going to sometimes make mistakes? Yeah, okay, we'll make some mistakes. But we'll do what we can to correct those. If we have the right, uh, the Spirit of God dwelling in us, it's going to say, well, correct that. All the time. And, and people know that. And, and, then, and then one man is using bad language, the next man is talking about God's Word and all that. And that don't, that don't it just doesn't go, does it? It's not, it does not go together. Um, as James talks about that specifically, you know, with the tongue, one minute we, we're, we're blessing God and praising Him, and the next minute we're cursing. You know, it just, it, it does not, 
it doesn't go. No. No. And there's so many people in the world today that feel like that that that's acceptable. That, you know, I, okay, yeah, maybe I messed up, but I can live like that. I can go over here and do what I want to. I can live after the flesh, but then I'll just clean myself up a little bit and I'll show up at the church doors. We can't live like that. No, no. You're not going to do it. Not like that. So we just need to understand the importance of this lesson for all of us. Can a Christian be lost? Yes. We have to be careful. We have to make sure that we uh, are fulfilling our obligations. You know? If, if, we, if we live in the, just the world uh, as a, a regular person, let's say, not, not thinking in terms of Christian, uh, for our employers, uh, I show up at 12 o'clock. Business starts at 8. Um, when I'm there, I sleep at the desk. Uh, you know, when there's, uh, there's opportunities for me to, to, uh, to uh, pull from the, the profits, I do that. What's an employer going to do with an employee like that? They're not going to last long, right? It's not gonna, we're not going to allow that to happen. And yet in the spiritual sense, if you, and here again, like Steve's thinking, you got to, you really got to think outside just yourself. You got to start doing some, some, some probing of the mind in terms of, of God. How would God think? How does God view us? Here I am, and, and just go back and rewind your last you know, few weeks or last few days or whatever. I'm coming to worship today. How have I conducted myself? How have I lived my life? How have I dealt with people? And if I can't answer that in a, in, in a, a, a way that says, uh, you know, although I'm not perfect, I, I, you know, I, I did the best I could. I was kind to people. I, you know, I made sure I, I, I watched my language. Uh, I did the best I could as far as uh, working where I worked living before people, making the right example, then I can come together to worship with God and, you know, in, in, in good conscience say, you know, I can worship today. But if I have been living like the world, it doesn't stop at the back doors. I bring it in here. People know how we live. And we've got to be careful because... Any one of us can get, be lost at any time if we choose to abandon what we know to be the walk that we should be walking in. And so we need to be careful, and this lesson is important, uh, not only to refute a false doctrine that says Christians are saved once and always saved, but to also understand where we, where we are and that we are obligated and we have to have a dedicated effort to continue to do what we're doing. We've got to make the right decisions. We've got to continue to make those decisions um, until, until the day we die. We don't, we don't uh, pass a milestone, you know, yep, I made it to such and such age and I did good for, for a long time, you know, now I can just go out and do what I want to. Uh, it's a lifelong commitment. Once we die to the flesh and we live in the spirit, it's, it's a commitment that we have, an obligation to live the rest of our days that way. And we need to understand that. Um, all right, F Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. We usually talk about these passages in terms of uh, the, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of our Lord and Savior. But look at what he says um, as he introduces this and we sometimes maybe don't pay attention to, to these verses moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you 
Paul, obviously, to the Corinthian brethren, he preached the gospel. The city of Corinth, we read back in, in the, the book of Acts. And Paul preached the gospel. So the gospel was preached, what happens? Which also you received, that means they believed it, they responded to it. That would mean that they repented of their sins, they were recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God, and they were uh, baptized, which put them into the body of Christ. And he says, not only did I preach it to it, you received it, and he says, wherein you stand. That's where you are right now. You're standing in the gospel. That means that you're living according to the gospel. And that's something that's, that we need to understand is important. When we stand in the gospel or living in the gospel, that means we have believed it and we have rendered obedience to what God has asked us to do. And we stand in the gospel, we stand in the body of Christ. That's where these people are. That's what the gospel has done for them. And according to this, verse 2, the gospel has also saved them. So they're in a saved condition. There, there's no doubt what Paul's talking about here. Uh, I've, I've preached you the gospel, you received it, you're standing in it, and which this gospel has saved you because of their obedience to God's will. That's where they stand right now. They're saved. But look at what he says after that. You stand in the gospel, you're saved if, if, what? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you, you have believed in vain. Now, what does he mean, keep in memory? Yeah, I remember that I obeyed the gospel. I remember the date back then, and... Uh, that's all he wanted me to do was remember when that happened. And uh, it doesn't matter how I live. No, what Paul's talking about here is you constantly keep in memory what you did and who you are now. If, if you listen to the gospel, what does the gospel do? The, the gospel calls you out of the world to do what? To serve God. To be obedient to God. And the memory he's talking about here is a constant reminder. You keep in constant remembering what you have obeyed. And if you constantly remember the fact that you came out of sin, you gave up the life of sin, you're now living for Christ, and you're living according to what Christ has taught us through the gospel, that memory constantly reminds us that we must stay in that position. That's what he's talking about. And he says, uh, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless, what? You've believed in vain. So the idea here is that if I believe the gospel and I obey the gospel and I stand in the gospel and the gospel has saved me and then I forget, I fail to remember what the, the darkness of sin that I was in, if I failed to remember what I came out of, and I abandoned that, then he says, you, you've believed in vain. You've believed, you obeyed, but it's vain now, it's empty, because you have not kept in memory constantly, which would keep you standing in the gospel, standing in, uh, faithful to, to uh, the teachings of Christ. And so we need to pay attention to that. Um, Colossians chapter 1, let's turn over there. Colossians chapter 1. 21 through 23. And you, he says, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, you now hath he reconciled. So here again, Paul's talking about the process of believing the gospel. There are people who were alienated. They, they, they were walled off. 
They were not part of the Lord's kingdom. They were not part of those who were saved. But he says, this is who you used to be, but yet now you've been reconciled. You, you've been brought back in a relationship with God. He's brought you back. He says, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He's, he's, he's basically taking, as it were, you who were dirty, and he has cleaned you up, and he's brought you over to live in a different way, in a clean way before God. And he's made you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I mean, there's nothing else you can do. Okay? You have, you have cleaned, him, cleaned something up, you've polished it up, and, and it's in a brand new pristine condition. You can't do anything else to it. You're not going to make it any better. And that's what God has done to us when we remove sin out of our lives and we're obedient. Now that's where he's placed us. And that's where he wants us to remain. This is the condition that he talks about. You were alienated, you were isolated, you were walled off from God, but now you've been brought back in relationship with God, you've been cleaned up, and, and you're now supposed to stay in that, that position. And that's acceptable to God. But he, look at the conditions in verse 23. If these things, where you are now, you, you, you can't be blame, blamed, you can't be uh, reproved, you can't get on to you because you're living the way you're supposed to, but you're only going to stay in that, that condition in verse 23, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. As long as we stay in this condition, living the way God wants us to live, we're good. But if we don't stay there, if we move away from there, then we're in a condition that is not acceptable. And so we need to understand it's incumbent upon us to live a certain way. And that's, that's the whole message here. Once I become a Christian, I am a debtor. I have obligations to live a certain way. I can't live like the world. Because if I'm trying to live like the world, I'm not ex ex uh, pleasing to God and what he wants me to be. All right, Hebrews chapter uh, 10. Now we talk about this passage for about assembling together and being here to worship and being together when the church comes together. We use that for that passage a lot. I realize who it was written to. It was written to Hebrews who had obeyed the gospel. And because of persecution, they were saying, well, you know, maybe it's easier for us to go back and, and live according to Judaism, that we should go back under the law of Moses because we weren't being persecuted when we lived in that way. In, in the society in which they live with the Roman Empire in place, the Romans didn't really care what the people of various cities did as, as long as uh, it, they were peaceful and everything else. But, uh, you know, when Christ came along, there was so much, um, those who obeyed him were considered to be in a lot of regards against the, the Roman government, and the Roman government was concerned about it, and they uh, thought people were recognizing Jesus above their Caesar, and so there, there, were, there were persecutions that arose because of that. And they were thinking, well, let's go back to the law of Moses where we're just doing sacrifices here in the temple, and you know, we're not out trying to evangelize the world, and, and it's, 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 you know, it's uh, less of a, uh, of a problem for us. And so because of uh, those persecutions, there's no doubt was 
uh, a lack of assembling together to worship because of the persecutions that would come. So we use this and we read verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more of the day, so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, we read that and we use that passage a lot. But the idea of uh, the, the context here of them abandoning the, the, the New Testament church and worship and, and serving Christ to go back into Judaism, the idea of not assembling and not promoting and, and building up the church uh, because of their fears, he re- relates to that being sin. Now look at what he says in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, remember what he just talked about now, people who were forsaking the assembly, the idea of going back into Judaism, uh, away from Christ, away from trying to evangelize those to be followers of Christ, he says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. If we abandon what we know to be truth, if we abandon the obedience that we have to Christ, then it, it's a very dangerous thing. That would be for us willfully, knowledgeably, knowing that we are going to go back into something that we've come out of. And, and so for us, it may not be going back to, into Judaism for animal sacrifices, but it'll be going back into the world. We, we have become Christians to come out of the world to clean ourselves up from sin. And if we decide that we want to go back into the world, that's knowledge of willful sin. And he says there's no more sacrifice for sin. But because we've done that, there's a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So we need to be very careful about the, the concept that we hear about from so many people that um, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I mean, it's like, you know, Johnny is pointing out. I, I don't know how many times I've heard that term used by people. I'm a Christian but then profanity spews from their mouth. I'm a Christian, but, you know, I still indulge in alcohol. I'm a Christian, but, you know, whatever. You know, it's just a little something I do on the side. It's okay. I'm a Christian. Well, saying that you're a Christian does not mean you're a Christian. And even though you have... um, gone through the process of uh, being obedient to the gospel to the point of uh, giving yourself over to the water baptism um, doesn't guarantee you that you're a Christian. We're Christians when we have that, um, that feedback for the spirit that's within us. Christ in us, God in us, the Holy Spirit in us, that feedback, it says, I recognize you. I I recognize you as as one of mine. And when we, you know, will evaluate our lives and spend the time to ask the questions, we'll get an answer back. (laughs) You you, you know, that doesn't line up. You know, you're not lining up with what you know to be right. And that's where that uh, we need to be convicted to the point of changing our lives. But that, that's there all the time. As a Christian, I should be constantly asking myself, well, did, did I do right there? And we ought to, you know, get in that feedback. No, that wasn't right. Scripture teaches this. God would have us do this. The Spirit is letting us know that that's not what the will of God is. And if we're being led by the Spirit, we'll know those things. Jim, Jim nowhere says, says that 
if we're tempted, we're, we're given a way of escape. It kind of makes you wonder the source of that way of escape, about how is it consciously put in front of you to yeah. say, I mean, don't, don't, don't do that. Well, we don't know it's not from Satan, right? Exactly right. <laughs> it, makes, it makes you a little yeah. bit different light on that. Yeah. So, you know, I think we, we've looked at enough scripture. We understand that a Christian can be lost. We understand we have obligations. We understand that we need to live a certain way. We need to understand we, we walk in a certain way. There'll be fall, pitfalls, there'll be stumbling, but we pick ourselves up, we, we look at the path that we're on, and we say, yeah, that's still the right path I need to be on. I'll get rid of this, uh, this obstacle or whatever's in my way that's caused me to stumble. And I keep marching on uh, to the finish. Uh, And you, uh, you, need to, you need to be able to stand a, as one who is uh, doing what God wants us to do. First Corinthians. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter nine for just a second. And I guess that'll be the the best that we'll get today and so next week we'll we'll do the activities so be prepared for those first corinthians 9 look at verse 24 know ye not that they which run a race run all but one receiveth the prize so we understand that we're in a competition there's a there's a prize that's going to go to the winner. Now, how do you run that race? Do you run the race in such a way that you say, well, uh, let's just say, for example, you stumble coming out of the starting line. And uh, do, do you th at that point say, well, uh, I, I stumbled, so I'm not going to run the race anymore? Or do you pick yourself up and try to make up that, that, that lost time? What if you're halfway through the race and you're starting to fatigue and you need to, to uh, maybe go by and you need to get some water or something? You know, these long races, they have uh, little stations for that. Do you stop because you're thirsty? Do you quit running? Well, the idea here is you're running for a prize. Now, those in a regular race are usually running for the, the first place finish, and that, that's it. If the first place person gets, gets there and they're way ahead of it, do you quit running or do you finish the race even though you're not going to win? Well, the idea of living a Christian life is we run that we might obtain. That's why we run the race. Um, the latter part of verse 24. And every man that striveth for the, the mastery is temperate in all things. That means we're going to be able to, to tolerate things. We're going to have to be able to take some, some buffeting, some, some things that come our way and still keep running. Not give up. Um, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But Paul says we're running for an incorruptible crown. So we can't be uh, set aside by just little things that come along our way. We've got to be able to work around them. And so he says, I, I therefore so run not as uncertainly, not as not knowing how it's going to end up. If we run the Christian race we don't have to be first against other people we just have to finish our course and and do what god has asked us to do so he says so so if i not as one that beateth the air that is just you know flailing around uh not being able to accomplish anything just you know expending energy no but he says i run the race by um so that I can receive the crown. 
And he said, I do that so I can't preach to others. They look at me and say, well, you didn't finish the race. You were overcome by little pitfalls. He says, I run the race so that after I've preached to others, I myself would not be a castaway. So let's all run the race. Let's run the race even though there are difficulties and let's finish the race so that we can receive a crown of life. All right, next week, fill in the blank and uh, we'll see how far we get with that.